John Sylvester is one of the best paragliding pilots in the world. Over the last 20 years, he has been at the forefront of the sport. Where he goes, others follow. He was the first to fly the whole length of Wales in one record-breaking five-hour hop from near his home here in Daniel in Snowdonia, all the way to the Severn Bridge powered only by natural air currents. We're leaving home. <laughs> it is weird leaving Wales, isn't it? You realise how special it is to us. Those mountains are very flat. John is a true pioneer of the sport of paragliding and today his interest lies here and there is simply nowhere bigger and wilder. The Karakoram Mountains of northern Pakistan have the biggest concentration of high peaks and glaciers on earth with five of its peaks being over 8,000 meters tall. It is here that John's taken paragliding to new levels and to new extremes. He is a leading light in a small band of Himalayan flyers that are defining a golden age of mountain exploration by paraglider. We try to climb up this wild place. That is why I'm so interested in what John's doing. I want to experience the world as he sees it to understand what makes him so special. I want to see how he makes these impossible flights using just the air currents and riding on the wind on an eight kilogram nylon sheet controlled by just a few strings. I'm Alan Hughes, a filmmaker, and I've known John for many years. We live on the same hillside above Llanberis the adventure capital of Wales. We both share a passion for adventure and the high mountains of the world. I'm also fascinated by flying. In 1999, John and I flew together across the remote mountains of Western Nepal and made the now cult paragliding movie From Nowhere to the Middle of Nowhere. It was a 300 kilometer multi-day adrenaline fuel journey across some of the wildest mountains in the world. Trips like that don't come without their dodgy moments. Yeah, I'm okay. Good man. You okay? Yeah. And we had good weather. If I'm going to get the insight I want into John's latest adventures, I'm going to have to strap myself back onto the front of his tandem paraglider and go coal busting with him in the Karakoram. Okay, do you want to stand up, Al? I'm going to have to sit with him as he soars to over 7,000 metres and weaves a tenuous line across a previously unflown route through the high peaks of Pakistan. John is going to take me to places no one's been before. Places where even the birds don't fly. Ten years older and still no wiser, I find myself in Islamabad, the capital of Pakistan, en route to the fabled Hunza Valley, 500 kilometers to the north, 
and a place that John knows well. Anne and I are here at eight o'clock, eating breakfast before we leave, and we're both like so tired. It's like an alpine start in, in the Alps. Anne has declined his omelette. His stomach can't take it. And I've got a porridge to go. There are few tourists at the Paradise Hotel and John breakfast without myself or our third companion, John's flying buddy, Eddie Colfox. 20% chance of storms happening again. Yesterday it was 60%. So, so it's a better chance than yesterday, and we're off. It's time to go. The only road to Hunza is this one, the incredible Karakoram Highway. This fragile artery, high above the Indus River, joins Pakistan with China and follows one of the ancient pathways of the old silk routes. We're halfway up the Karakoram Highway and these are the sort of trucks we're seeing all the way up. Old British Bedfords. They're getting a bit rarer now though, so it's nice when you see them. Aren't they wicked? Just amazing things. And they're such little cabs. When you're actually driving in these, you feel so close to them. Made in England. This is the very best. Strong. Ah, oh, strong. <laughs> Is it your truck? Where are you going? Uh, we go Gilgit. Gilgit. Gilgit? Gilgit. Where is your country? Wales. The huh? star is Noid Radov. No? Noid Radov. No power steering. No? Yeah. Yes, no power steering this. More difficult. Yes. Is very hard. Or yeah. Strong. Ah. Yeah. Too much is strong. <laughs> We have been advised not to get off the highway at all to the west of it and not to stop in certain villages because of recent incursions by the Taliban. But all we see are smiling faces. The Hunza Valley is a Shangri-La surrounded by glistening giants. Dominating the skyline to the south is Rakaposhi, the Shining Wall. Beneath it, the remote and fertile valley provides the residents of its many villages with valued isolation from the rest of the world. Well, I've been coming to Hunza a long time. I think it was I think it was 1986 or maybe 87 I came here just to go and try and climb Bibla Moton, that mountain. And I think I've been here about eight times now, over 20 years. Hello. Hello. Tika? Good. Mr. John is famous in the village of Karimibad where he stays. He is the Chatriwala, 
or Umbrella Man, the one who does the impossible, the inconceivable, and flies like a bird over their highest mountains and still returns each night with a smile. The people of Karimabad are probably the most friendly people I've ever come across anywhere. Which, considering their background of being bandits, or supposedly being bandits, is quite amazing. If they think you actually like their environment, they sort of embrace you. Yeah, it's like a second home, really, Karimabad. It's, it's very beautiful for me. And how are you? Good to see you. Oh, look at the lady. Why do you remember his head? Hello. Nice to meet you, Ellen. How are you doing, mate? I told you John's right hand man in Karimibad is Mansur Hussein, a long time friend, Jeep driver, and fixer. Character, Mansur. I just see you in the bus and Karimibad. Yes, eagle eyes. I could see you. You look very well. Thank you. Thank you, okay. Since the events of 9-11, the once thriving tourist industry of Hunza has suffered badly. Hello John. Hello. How are you? Nice to see you again. Yeah, it's uh, very nice uh, here in Hunza Valley. People enjoy looking at uh, paragliders. It's a very new, new thing, you know. And he's uh, very well, well known here in this valley as a friendly paraglider. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> it's very nice of you, Shukrim. I have uh, the movie of you and him flying over the mountains of Nepal. Yeah. I remember your accident on the tree, yeah. landing on the tree, yeah. <laughs> both of you. Everyone wants to fly, but it is, and it is a risky <laughs> game. Yeah. I've got to know them, yeah, over the years. Yeah, yeah, it's nice. They're very nice people here. And quite crazy sometimes. <laughs> We're crazy in the sky, you're crazy down here. Yeah. In the villages of this high desert valley, life has always depended on glacier meltwater. And throughout the valley, there is an intricate network of canals. In a bid to acclimatize, we trek up to the source of Karimibad's water, the Ultar Glacier. Halfway up to um, Ultar Meadows at the moment, walking up the gorge with the glacier in it. And behind us here, there's the water channels. They've been put there to collect all the glacial meltwater. You can hear it roaring down just below us. And it's about this point the glacier starts melting. So all that water is collected and taken along these channels. The lowest channels were the original ones, and they were also the easiest to build. But as the population expanded, they needed to take the water further away from the main villages to keep gaining, gaining um, fertile land from the desert. So they had to build channels higher and higher up this um, gorge. And they're pretty stunning when you look at them. And there's constant rockfall coming down. I mean, we're walking on big lateral moraine here. And it's two years since I've walked up here and the path has totally changed. We've come up to Altar Meadows, which is uh, just over three, three, two or something. And it's a pretty special place for me, actually, because I used to come up here climbing in my youth and spend quite a lot of time here trying to climb some of these mountains. John's first visit to Hunza was as a climber. That was back in the 1980s, when he attempted the first ascent of this impressive spire called Biblimoting, or Ladyfinger. That attempt ended in failure, but John could never have guessed then that one day he would be the first to float up these granite faces and soar their ice cream summits. But for us today, we've just come for a nice walk and 
going to have tired legs tomorrow, I think. But yeah, it should have helped us acclimatise. Because otherwise, when we get a very big day and we might go up to 7, 7, 5, we'll really notice it. So the sooner we get, get working a bit better. Keep running, keep running, keep running, keep running, run, 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 run! Back in my seat properly. It's a bit of a shock for me at first. I've not flown for a decade. What made things worse was that the initial climb out of the valley was difficult and dangerous. We had to scratch in close to the rock faces to catch any lift. If we hit turbulence, there'll be no room for error. My mouth was dry from the word go. The green fields of Hunza have cold water constantly poured over them and don't provide any thermals. The only rising air low down are the narrow blips rising above the steep sunny rock faces. Despite my trepidation, that's where we have to be. The tandem glider is wider, faster and clumsier than the single or solo glider that John is more used to. When flying in Nepal we actually snagged a tree with a wingtip. So this is one part of John's judgement I'll always be nervous about. The cliffs are a thousand metres high. Three thousand feet of hard, unforgiving rock and we have to scratch for what seems to be ages to get up. Despite the butterflies in my stomach, I have to let John concentrate. A gripping hour later and we're still scratching, high above the gorge we walked yesterday. Then, suddenly, at 4,000 metres, we are released. And tell her what was going on then? <laughs> Well, we managed to scratch up the wrong face in all the horn to 4 2, then get a nice climb off the top of it. It's really quite nice, we had a 360 after cranking this thing in bigger rates for 2000. And I'm still in the t shirt, I haven't zipped up yet, I'm just starting to get cold. We're 4 6. Four six. Four six, so we've got a long way to go. And our new tandem is performing very nicely. At the snow line, the thermals join up and accelerate getting strong enough to allow John to choose which one he takes. This is a nice solid 6.3. First really nice easy climb. Glider's just following it round nice and easy, it's great. The bleeping noise is the vario. It tells us how fast we are climbing. The faster the bleeps, the faster the climb. Are we doing okay? Yeah, I'm feeling really good. We're about five, eight. And... Hoping we're going to glide this coal. I was a bit lazy, I should have got more height probably. We're going to have a look at maybe the bigger. Doesn't look as big at the moment, does it? No. We're pretty high up on it. Unlike John, the motion and altitude has an immediate effect on me, and I'm feeling a little nauseous. We're going to make it through the cow. Oh, so. Well, that's all great. So that's half a bit done. Oh. Oh. Ah, oh, it's amazing. Very quickly, the raw grip of altitude hits me. I remember this dizzy world. Frozen face, frozen fingers. 
I lose the horizon while filming, which makes me even more nauseous. My breathing speeds up and my brain slows down. I'm back in John's world. Watching our shadow on the mountain rush by, I see just how fast we are travelling through the thin air. You feeling okay? Yeah, very good. Enjoy yourself. I carry on filming, but I'm making mistakes with the camera. I'm out of my comfort zone and three of the normal five warning lights in my head are flashing red. It's absolutely beautiful up here, but strangely otherworldly for me in my state. Rakaposhi comes into view. It's 30 kilometers away and John tells me that's where we're going. Realizing that means more spinning around and round in thermals, I decide the only thing I can do is close my eyes and hold on to my stomach lining. You okay, John? Yeah, I'm doing good. You just want one more climb, light to Rakaposhi, you go back down to the north side of Rakaposhi. We have gone up to over 6,000 metres, that's 20,000 feet, in a little over an hour. No wonder my breakfast's on my shoulder. I really enjoyed myself. Eventually, we reach Rakaposhi's north face, one of the tallest mountain faces on the planet. You can go close in if you want to. No. No? No, it's OK. OK. <laughs> Flying home now! Flying home! Flying home for a cup of chai and cigarette. Well, look up there, though. I tell you what, if we'd been geared up, we'd have had a chance on that tonight. Yeah? Yeah, we haven't got enough warm clothing to get frostbite, but... 5.20! Eh? 5.20! Yeah, yeah. Is it? It is late. We took off about... 20 to 3, I think. Jim, I got everything ready and you'd come over, it was half two, so. Quite a long flight, you know. Yeah. About three hours. Oh, it's horrible. We make the 30 kilometers back to Karimabad in one smooth half hour glide. Okay, landing now. Oh! <laughs> Okay. Yeah, are you all right? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I just went on my arse straight it's away. It's all right. Oh, what a flight. <laughs> Not your most pleasurable one, I would imagine. We've just done the circuit, really, of the valley. But we put in um, the top of Ladyfinger and Hunza Peak to start with. And then we cruised down, managed to climb on Rakaposhi, and we could have gone, we could have gone very high on Rakaposhi, I think, but we didn't go so high, about six. And then a really lovely glide all the way back. It's I, had, nice. I had a feeling you were tempted to go high on Rakaposhi, because the... Yeah, I would, have, I would have stayed there for another hour, I think, just yeah. to see. <laughs> this was only a warm-up flight an acclimatising trek around the valley, and I wasn't up to it. If I'm going to do a new route with John over the mountains and film it, I'll have to get a grip. Come <laughs> on! 
Powder milk, my children, they don't like to drink a powder milk. They want real milk. We have a lot of different kind of fruit, apricots, apples, peaches. We don't have a mangoes and a bananas, the rest of the fruit we have. Okay. Hunza is a peaceful place in a troubled country. The people here are famed for their longevity and pity us in the West because we don't have fields to go to. John also considers himself lucky, for this is a place where he can dream, with his eyes wide open. And this year, his eyes are drawn to the golden pillar of Spantic, and the Hispar and Chogolungma glaciers beyond. Initially I like flying because of the excitement of doing a sport, like driving or riding a motorbike or climbing, something like that. But now I think I like it because it lets you go up there really and explore places that really they're off limits to a normal person unless you're a climber. And even then it takes you days really to access some of the places that we can go to on a paraglider. So they're just tools really, they just allow you to go up into those remote places in a day and see things that otherwise you'd just see from a huge distance through a pair of binoculars or a camera. So. If you choose the right places to do your flies, they're actually quite safe. But some of the more exciting routes, if you don't make it, you're in serious shit, really. It's, <laughs> you don't want to land up there. It's quite a shock, isn't it, to take off here in a very civilised environment, and you end up there, and you're totally isolated in the iciest, most inaccessible mountains, basically. And you can do it within an hour. You're suddenly catapulted up there and you can't see any green, it's just up there. Although John was not the first to climb this phase of Ladyfinger, he was the first to fly it. Lots of icicles, now that gives you an idea how steep it is, those icicles. They're hanging free from the wall. Gliding past, it's very hard to get an idea of the um, scale and the size. I probably had a wingtip metres away from a rock face in dynamic wind at 6.4 or something. And it was very close, and yet it felt great to me. Absolutely huge wall. I wouldn't like to catch a tip on this because... <laughs> <laughs> well, you'd have to jump me as well, there's still any chance. Look at those icicles there! Look at those! Massive! I love icicles. That is the worry, I think, of altitude. That maybe you're a little bit more relaxed than you would be normally. And also, you're gliding very fast. I would say at least 60 kilometres an hour we're, we're actually gliding at. And if you've got a downwind component, it's even faster. And that means if, you're, if you are close to terrain and you get a collapse or anything goes wrong, if you hit, it's all going to happen faster and you can have a bigger impact. And that's especially important, I think, to me when I've thought of top landing some... You get a nice snowy 6,000 metre peak and you're right over the top of it. And you sort of, you're almost skimming the top, thinking, oh, I could land here, easy. And then you try and logically think, no, but my shadow is going very, very quickly over the top of this mountain. That is the summit of Hunterpeak. And I'm pretty sure if you tried to land at six straight off, you'd crash. And it's top landable. Well, it is quite lovely today. But I'm not going to. Yeah, the game here really is to take off without walking very far. So we can get a jeep just up to the Eagle's Nest at 
And from there we take off, have to ridge saw for quite a long way, maybe a thousand meters before we actually get thermals of hot air that are rising up. And just like birds, we go in, do circles, gain height until we get to the clouds because those, those lumps of hot air come up and they go all the way up to the clouds where they condense and form water droplets. So if we see a good cloud here, we can glide underneath it and then climb very, very quickly up to it. And once we've done that here, you've got this new element of exploring because this main valley's got a road in it, which is great. It's really, really easy access for us. And if you land anywhere on this road, you can always get back to here easily. But the game sort of starts in a way when you get to cloud base and then decide to cross. So you'll want to go exploring into the back of the mountains. And over there, it's totally different to here. There's no roads, no footpaths, no people, absolutely nothing. It's just a wilderness of ice and snow. John's flying buddy in Hunza is Eddie Colfox. Eddie made some of the early pioneering flights in Hunza with John and is back after seven years. Is it intimidating for a non-mountaineer? Yeah, no, I'm a non-mountaineer and a non-climber. A man who's scared of heights, but I paraglide. Um, yes, it is intimidating. Yeah, they're big, they're, you know, it's cold. It's very high. All those things are intimidating. It involves many, many thoughts and processes and analysis. You're fully absorbed whilst flying. That's one of the other aspects that I love about flying is that when you're, when you're doing it, you're fully absorbed in it and whatever troubles, joys, whatever other considerations are normally fluttering through your mind, they're far away. It's really just about where's the lift and is this safe? <laughs> Two considerations you have. <laughs> Where do I go next? <laughs> you're constantly assessing so many different aspects of the environment you're in. It's like sailing a boat, you know, you're constantly moving. It, Hansa actually even has some apparent rescue facilities. Apparently we could get a helicopter here if it was required. Um, it makes me think, feel happier about coming knowing that there is you know, some chance of rescue. But of course, you know, if you have an accident here, the mountains of the helicopter will only go, go up to 5,000 meters, and we, we, we spend a lot of our time above 5,000 meters. So if you have an accident above that height, somehow or other, you've got to get down to a height that a helicopter will come. Um, so in reality, it's not actually that supportive. It's just emotional and mental preparation, which is very significant. Because a lot of it, a lot of flying is about the suspension of disbelief. You can fly. You can do these things. You won't have an accident. Accidents might happen, but they only happen if you're either very unlucky or rather foolish. Al's decided he wants a warmer face. And also his helmet looks rather old. <laughs> so Eddie's got this that's actually too small for him. But we're just a bit concerned about me having this embedded in my face on takeoff or landing. So our solution is to stick an old Nestle water bottle on the back. Yeah, you will go more high. Ellen's have old birds are flying, look, and you are still here. <laughs> Inshallah, you will go more higher than yesterday. On the balcony of the Mulberry Hotel in Karimibad, 
Breakfast for Flies is always a leisurely affair, with a lot of gazing up at the sky and studying the clouds. Later in the morning, Mansur plays his part and rhymes us up to take off. We've probably got half an hour, and if in half an hour that subsides a bit, then we'll fly. That's huge. That's, that's a, a huge one. That's a monster. Yeah. But it's snowing, isn't it? Snowing over there and snowing over there. And that's only 20k away. I will guess within 20 minutes we'll be quite soggy. Getting, um, we've had huge overdevelopment today. We didn't fly. And when these clouds get big, you don't tend to get thunder and lightning, it just snows like down here at Rakaposhi, it's hammering out of that cloud. And when that happens, you get huge gust fronts come with it. They're sort of a bit different to normal thunder clouds. I think it's probably when the, the ice and the snow that's coming out evaporates. I think it cools the air even more and they get stronger and stronger. And this is what's worrying for us really, are these things. This is the speciality of this place. Massive microbursts. We are grounded and we have a week of bad weather. When I was here two years ago, I remember filming them loads and they were too heavy or too light and they collapsed or just went straight down. But this year, they put bits of polythene wrapped up and they got the wing loading away. Right. You do! Time in Hunza is nearly up, and the weather takes a turn for the worse. It's really rare to hear thunder here. It just, I don't think it's um, humid enough. It's just too dry normally. So to hear this, it means it's pretty bad weather coming in. We're going to go flying. This is the first flyable day in two weeks and my only chance to fly before I go home. We have to go for it. After scratching the first thousand metres, we hook a meaty thermal and scream up past the snow line in strong conditions. Ahead, the clouds look good for coal busting. Very nice thermal. It's a bit rough, but it's big and strong. The thermal cores are very strong and the glider's pitching around violently.
5,000 metres, the air settles down a bit, giving us enough time to take stock. It's decision time. John assesses his suspect cargo. How are you feeling? John, hold it together. I sense John is hatching a plan as we glide into the unknown. Ahead is a jumble of jagged peaks and crevassed glaciers. It's like crossing to another world. He's getting focused on Shishpa, the massive pointed mountain at the back of the valley, a further 18 kilometers in. I suspect that's where we're going. I think I might turn on that one out, it's good. Now I'm going to find out just how good John is. The high altitude air becomes bitterly cold and my face starts to freeze. But the full face helmet is a winner. With the visor down, it's warm and I hide behind it. I close my eyes as much as I can and put my faith in John. But using the camera, means I have to open them and that brings on the motion sickness. I've never been sick in a full face helmet before. I'm silently struggling, hypoxic, freezing, already several days walk from civilization and I'm wondering once again if I can handle the raw reality of John's world. I've no choice though, he isn't going to turn back now. This is what I signed up for, a ride in the hot seat to the cutting edge of extreme altitude flying. As the ridge gains height, the thermals get weaker and we drop behind it. We are now trapped in a huge amphitheatre of several 7,000 metre giants. If we get dumped here, 
will have an epic walk out. 18 kilometers of dangerous hiking down that glacier that's laced with crevasses and through that narrow gorge in the distance. I feel like running away before it's too late. Are we gliding out? Huh? Are we gliding out? I doubt it. I feel we're on a knife edge, just about holding on to our precious height. I see the escape route disappearing in the distance. John's not looking back, he's relishing being here, he's loving it. Try to get a climb in this groovy little cup of life. Get through this shish rock hole. I need to call for Stinger, this is a new project. Make it to my stick. So if we get into place here, we'll do it. We're climbing. What a wild place. Try to climb up in this wild place to get through the Shishbok hole. And I think it's about six too. But what a place to be furthering. It's ridiculous. This is what Flagging Hunt is all about. New little projects and exploring. About 20k from launch, but look where we are. As soon as you go over the back, it's just awe inspiring. And no one's probably ever been through this call ever. So it's like a first. And we're climbing. It's getting better. We might do this out. That'd be ace. For all John's confidence, I'm worried. I can see we're not climbing and I hide away in my helmet as we hunt around for the lift. Each time we get a blip, we lose it again. The lift we need's not there. The thermals are dissipating too low and well below where we need to be. I spy the call we need to cross under our wingtip. We've a long way to go to escape this place. After an hour fruitlessly searching for a thermal, John changes tactics and makes a committing decision. Knowing that a very light west wind might provide lift if we get close enough, he takes us to the very back of the amphitheatre and tucks in frighteningly close against the mountain face. A bold move that firmly closes the door of escape. Staring through the viewfinder of my camera, there's now only the huge and menacing presence of the mountain looming. The call looks impossibly high above us. I'm scared. I know a downdraft could collapse the wing and that these slopes wouldn't hold us if we hit them. Even if they did, there'd be no rescue here. We'd freeze or starve to death. But John's flying as if he's home on the friendly slopes of North Wales not committed to a dangerous route through the biggest mountains in the world. Fear has to be embraced as a friend sometimes, and again I give myself up to that cool analytical logic that John seems to have in such abundance. Don't get too close! This is scary stuff. We are over 6,000 metres now, and the thin air means the terrain is rushing by much faster than normal. We're so close at times, I start to worry about stones falling down the face and hitting us. The higher we get, the closer in we have to get to the face to find the lift. It's a tense time.
All five warning lights in my head are flashing red. But we are climbing. The tactic is working. And we slowly beat our way up the face. Eventually, we get to within 50 meters of the col we need to cross. We missed it! John is in the zone, and I've got to hang in there and do my job. Close to John means a wingtip brushing the mountain, which we are almost doing. My heart sinks when I see what's on the other side. John is celebrating, but my eyes are firmly fixed forwards. All I see is danger. In my head, all five red lights are flashing like mad and the sirens are screaming. We're in sinking air over a cold north face now and literally dropping out of the sky. John releases the trimmers to get more speed, which makes the glider more unstable. We've got to clear this glacier. I don't think we'll make the glide. I think we're in trouble. I can feel us falling. We are trapped in a sinking catabatic wind. That's exciting! Oh, we're not off yet, ah, we've got a long drive, we can't have at it. Got big in. My eyes are fixed on the nearest rocks and possible source of lift. They're a long way away, possibly 10 kilometres or more. dumped here we're dead. Even if we did survive a crash landing without falling into a crevasse, we'd never walk out without being swallowed by this glacier. So we've got to climb down this glacier. I, think, I don't know which one it is, I think it's passing. Okay. Got to glide off this glacier to get safe back in the valley. It's about 20, 30 k. What an amazing place and I think we're okay now. But look at this place. It's always more exciting to do something new. Oh, my toes are so cold.
It's not going back now. No going back now, Al. <laughs> it's a climb. But we're going to make it, man. We're definitely going to make it now. Wicked, I've never been in here before. Yeah, I want to do. Good glider. You tried really hard there. Huh? You tried really hard there. Oh, yeah. It was a, I could see there was a chance. But we managed to link up the glacier climb with the face climb, so we came in with about 500 foot on the face climb and gained 300 foot, and it was just enough, wasn't it? And then we're below the car, and I thought, and we ridge sawed it. I mean, Outrageous. West wind, you see, Al. We had a west wind today, so just that help was enough. Wow, look up there. We're in the Pachala. Made up with that. <laughs> Another call. New route. A little new route. And very interesting because you get this north face view, don't you? They're always the best faces of north. Oh, but I'm really cold now. I am. Yeah. Toes are just icy. Well, we'll warm up over there. We'll come down to about four and a half. What height were we up there? Six five. Six five. Four. My little fingers are almost done. Eventually, we reach the safety of the warm rocks and their gently rising air. I've been immersed in John's world, and I must say, it's a nice, warm feeling to be coming out of it alive. Ah! Oh, shit, they must be frozen. We have completed a new route in the Karakoram, a new aerial trek that in time others will repeat, flying in John's wake. So that's Shishbar, the thing we've just been through the call of. And we've just glided all the way down this glacier. And we're still at 5-1. It's amazing. It's been a wild ride. A little glimpse into a world that I'd have neither the courage nor the skill to enter alone. We're going to land. John Sylvester is a rare individual. He loves adventure. He loves the wild places and the challenges they present him. He has an affinity with air and a deep understanding of this environment. He can control his fear in the face of difficult and dangerous situations. And that's why he's respected as one of the very best pilots in the world, a true pioneer in what I'm sure will be looked back upon as the golden age of mountain exploration by Paraglider. 
Whoa, we're down. <laughs> Hello. Assalamu alaikum. We're not hot yet, are we? No. Oh, my ears hurt, mate. It's another new route, John. A new route. <laughs> Quite scary. Yeah. Quite windy here, isn't it, Al? Just before you went through the call, I was retching, I was alien. I know, I noticed that, and yeah. I, I saw the camera wasn't functioning properly, and I was fiddling, trying to be ill and trying to get the camera working. <laughs> but I think I got it. And I was ignoring you. <laughs>